A face from the 90s with a musical homage to the 80s and celebrating 50 years of one of TV's biggest ever shows that started in the 70s. Searching for the Answers is the latest single from Kevin Devine, drawing on influences like Human League, Simple Minds, Craftwork, Depeche Mode, Ultravox and Visage. He has created a synth sound reminiscent of the 80s and very much back in vogue and joins me now on the show. Hi Kevin, thanks for joining me. How are you doing fam? I'm delighted to be here. How are you today? I'm absolutely fantastic. Thank you for asking. First of all, um, I can't believe it that it is the 50th anniversary of That's Life which was aired on BBC One and I used to watch it every week. Uh, with the family and the show had some great features each week including search for a star could you tell us what that feature was all about who who because that was really classed as i would say the first reality kind of tv yeah. uh, kind of competition yeah it was uh, and firstly I, I can't believe it's 50 years since that's life came on here because that that reminds me that i'm a lot older than i thought i was <laughs> um, that's the first thing. Uh, it, yeah, I joined the show because of this um, Search for Star competition that they'd done in 1991. And, and it was kind of revolutionary because um, it was an open audition. Yes. Normally all of these talent shows, you had to, it was behind the scenes auditions, you had to be in the business somewhere, this sort of thing. But um, that's like threw the doors open and said, we're going to interview anyone. If you think you can do it, come along. So I was really excited about that because I always wanted to sort of get into television, but I didn't know how. No, uh, right. And I still don't know how, but but, but anyway, at that time, um, I, you know, I jumped a train. I was living in Edinburgh at the time. I jumped a train down and queued on the streets of London overnight for about, two, well, it was, it was more than a night, uh, 27 hours. Wow. And I was I panicked into coming down because I when they announced it and I phoned the show the next day, uh, a lovely lady who I ended up getting to know called Ruth, um, I asked her, I said, look, is there any way I can be guaranteed to be seen because I'm coming all the way from Scotland? And she just went, nope, nope. Oh, and I went, okay. That's a bit sharp, oh. isn't it? Oh, no, no, it was, it was fine because she'd had hundreds of calls that day. I bet, I bet. And all the questions were the same. And uh, Sorry, Beth, not Ruth, Beth, it was Beth. Beth. And she was from Yorkshire. And she's absolutely lovely. So, uh, so I jumped in the train and I came down because she said, there's going to be thousands of people. They're going to start queuing tonight. So I came down on the overnight train on the Monday night. The auditions yeah. were on the Wednesday morning. And when I got to the Hammersmith Pally, I actually was a wee bit disappointed because there was no one else about. And I felt, <laughs> felt a bit of a fool. But it actually turned out to be the very best thing that could have happened to me. Because I phoned the show again. Yes. And I spoke to Beth again. And she was she was absolutely delightful that day. And, and I said, look, I, I've, I've come down. I'm just checking I'm in the right place. Can you tell me it's definitely the Hammersmith Pally because I seem to be the only person here. And she said, oh, well, well, no, you are in the right place and good luck. She wished me good luck. She was very, you know, very good. Wow, excellent. And and that, the next thing I knew later on in the day, other people did start arriving, but I was at the front of the queue. Yeah. And they sent the show sent down a photographer to take a picture of me because they thought, well, this is the first guy in the, in the queue. We'll get a picture taken. So that was the first sort of little thing that happened. And then, of course, overnight, uh, the nightclub, the Hammersmith Pally, opened. So we were all kicked away, go away and come back once the nightclub's finished. So we all went across the road in different places. And then at about four o'clock in the morning, they said, right, you can come back over. So we all ran back over. And I had been pushed down the, the, the queue very slightly, you know, right. even though I was, I, everyone knew I was first in the queue. Yes. So the follow, the follow, sorry, I'm going into so much detail for you here, Phil. No, no, this is great. I, I hope you've got a 24-hour show, because uh, I can give you detail. I'm sure so, we can extend it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the very next morning, um, everyone started to arrive. The crew started to arrive. The presenters started to arrive. Esther arrived. Wow. And of course, the, 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 the queue, we were all so hyper at that point. Going, oh my God, this is real. It's happening. Yeah. And so they all went into the pallet and then a researcher called Angela Wallace came out and she said, excuse me, who's this guy that's first in the queue? And there was a chap who'd sort of run back and he went, oh, I am, I am. And I was standing there going, 
actually it's me. Yeah. And one of the girls that was in the queue, she went, no, you're not, you're not, it's Kevin, he's been here longest. So I really thank her for that because I didn't speak up, she spoke up for me. And then she said, oh, Esther wants to see you. So I did a little interview with Esther and she was asking why, and it, you know, it was that's life. You don't get chances like this, so you just have to go for it. So that little snippet was done, and I was so naive because when we went in and we went through the whole audition process, we were filmed again, and I thought that simply because they had filmed you, you were definitely going to be on the on the tier tell. Yes, like, yes. I had never heard of the cutting room floor, no. so I was very naive. Anyway, we, we, I, I came back up to Scotland uh, the following day. Uh, didn't know what was going to happen. We were all just told, go home. If you've got so far, we will call you back. And I naively, as I say, thought I was going to be on the telly. So I told my boss at the time, look, I think I'm going to be on the TV on Sunday night. And he was great. He was great about it and really got behind us, as did the whole... Uh, I was living, I was working in a caravan park at the time. Right. And all the staff and everyone, some of the owners, they all got behind me, which was fantastic. And sure enough, they featured me on the following Sunday. And then I was the following week after that, I was invited down to take a week on the show where you were a guest and you had to do a story and things. Yeah. So there were seven finalists and over that sort of seven week period, we all had a week on the show each. And I, my first story was to dress up as a granny with, you know, an old hat on and a wig. And I remember you know. saying it actually, it was very uh, yeah, funny. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, was Bradley, I, I was sent to Bradley because the story was the council had said, you could no longer park coaches on the seafront you have to park a mile away and then walk to the seafront. Oh. So of course, all, all the grannies were up in arms going, this is, we can't even walk a hundred yards, son. You know what? No. And the, the council's excuse was, well, you don't need to go to the beach. You can go to the nearby leisure centre, which was, you know, flumes and all this sort of thing. And yes. so I dressed up as the granny and I tried to walk. We recreated the walk and then I went back to the, the swimming pool. And there's a great shot, uh, Andrew Fettis, who was the, 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 the wonderful director, He's got a great shot of me going down one of these flumes, going round and round and round, with my legs up in the air, my stock <laughs> on, you know, the thick stock. <laughs> so, and I splash into the water. So it was all a bit of fun. And I thought, this is exactly the sort of thing I expected to be doing on that life. So, went back home, I'd done my week, there were other finalists, and then we were all called down for the final. And you're right in that it was the first sort of time all of these uh, things have been done, because when the show went out that night for the seven finalists, we had to sing our phone number, which was 0898-654-104. I still remember my number. Excellent. And we had to sing a wee song to sing a number. Then we all went home and nobody knew. The phone lines were open, nobody knew. Nowadays it's all done very quickly on the night, all of this. Yes. So on the Wednesday morning, I flew back down to London, had no idea. You know, I really had, did not think I was going to win. I really didn't, because I thought all these other people, they, they were brilliant. Yeah. Uh, you know, I thought, well, it's good. I got here, I've enjoyed it. And then Esther, when we went back to the, the Hammersmith Pally, all seven of us were lined up in a wee semicircle. And before we started filming, uh, some of them were firing questions at Esther to try and trick her. <laughs> right. Things like, uh, did the, the voting go the way you expected? You know, things like, uh, questions like that and uh, she said sort of she said it was directly in response to the number of letters we've had about you all oh, amazing and funnily enough a week or so before one of the producers had pulled me aside and said Keith we've had loads of letters about you because in the back in the day you had to physically write in that's right, right. post right on a post uh, answers on a postcard and things on like a that postcard. kind of thing yeah. answers on a postcard. so at that point I went ooh I might have a little chance here. Yeah. And other questions like, do you think the, the public will accept the presenter that, you, that has been selected? She said, yes, I think they will. So anyway, came the moment, you've all been winners. There were a total number of 331,383 votes. Oh my Can't. God. You've all had thousands and thousands of votes. But the winner with 117,287 uh, was Mr. Kevin Durang. And I, I was stunned because I genuinely did not think I was going to win it. And I didn't know what to say. And I actually started tearing up. I was quite so emotional about it. Mm -hmm. The difference back in those days was we weren't in front of the big live studio audience. 
it was just on film, on camera. So anyway, that, that was, I was stunned beyond belief. Um, delighted, but stunned. And then before I knew it, I was in the back of a, a minibus going out to the North End Road in London, doing a Vox Pop. Oh, right. Chatting to the, chatting to the public. Yes. And Esther was saying, this, this chap's just won the job on that's life. Any advice for him? And at that time, I was wearing uh, so what I thought were really cool, Gavici jumpers. You know, right. so I was playing the salesman, so I thought these were really cool. And everyone slagged off the jumper. It was quite, it was a baptism of fire in a way, which I thought was hilarious. And then, and they were going, oh, your hair, mate, you need to get a different haircut, you need to do this. Because <laughs> everyone's got an opinion. Yeah. So I was thrown in. And then I joined the show and sort of went from there. And uh, over the next four years, I was thrown into everything. I did, you know, I, I interviewed surfing dogs. I interviewed counting dogs. <laughs> uh, I, I, I uh, confronted con men. I doorstep con men. I went undercover. You know, I had wigs and glasses and, and secret cameras on. Like the but, cook report. Yeah, well, that was... Around Except the, a more team. It, 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 but yeah. the thing, uh, Roger was very upfront with everything. Yes, he was, Roger, yeah. Was such a dynamic. We, we actually shared the same agent. And he was a very dynamic reporter and he oh, yes. all teams behind him. But he was going for the IRA, for gun runners, for drug re- He was going for really big things. We went for con men. And all the people that were a bit a little bit woo, a little bit woo. Yes. They thought they away with it until we turned up. Uh, and I even one day we were investigating a, a thing called cut and shut cars. And that's where they take accident damaged cars. If right. the front's been damaged, they chop it off and then they get a car that's been damaged at the back, shot that off and weld the two together. Oh my goodness. And it's really, if somebody does it well, it can be all right, but Mm -hmm. a lot of these people were not doing it well. And one poor chap, which sparked a story, he was killed when he was in an accident and the car just basically fell apart around him. So, uh, and that was a tragic story that, that, that we uncovered and went for that. So I went to confront this particular con man and we had the crew standing by. Yeah. I had all my, my disguises on, my secret cameras. And we knew this car was wrong. It was a cut and shut. So I had arranged for an AA man to come along. To right. Do a, to do a survey in the car. And at that point, I was going to give the cue, is, does that mean it's a cut and shut? And at that point, the crew were meant to jump out. So we, we did all that. I said, is that a cut and shut? No crew. They were strolling down rather than running down. <laughs> so this guy, this con man, the two of them sussed something was going on. They jumped in the car and they drove off. <sighs> so, but they only drove just about 100 metres away because they, they knew something was wrong. They couldn't quite figure out what it was. Right. So I said, let's just sit in our car and wait. Their curiosity is going to get the better of them and make sure you've got the cameras running. <laughs> so, <laughs> right. I was right. About a minute later, they drove across, wound down the window, started hurling abuse. But what they did was they drove past us into the car park and there was only one entrance in, one entrance out. So I jumped out of the car and I stood across this entrance with a microphone at the ready. Right. They then turned round and put the foot down and they just drove at me. Oh so my goodness. They're actually trying to run me down. Yes. So I jumped out of the way. I jumped out of the way and then I actually got a wee bit angry because I thought, how dare you? Yeah. I, I cleaned that up, by the way. That wasn't what yes. I said. Yeah. yeah. How dare you? They were having a beep on there. Yes, yes. How <laughs> dare you? <laughs> and I started chasing him. And, and then he stopped and he reversed. He tried to get me again. And, and I was, you know, all the while, why are you doing this? Why are you selling these cut and shut cars? Don't you know how dangerous they are? Yeah. So, so technically, technically, I suppose I risked my life uh, yes. on the show. But, but that was, you know, myself, Adrian Mills, Gavin, we've all been there, done that. Esther herself has confronted Cormen. Yes. Uh, and it's, it's it, your heart's going like that. It's really, oh, it's I bet. Really, but at the same time, you need to get the story. You have to get the story. Yes. And, and basically, you know you're in the right and they're in the wrong. And you yes. just point that. So, so that was a wonderful thing about That's Life. And as I say, all the fun things that I... I flew to America to interview a painting elephant. Right. A, a painting elephant called Rosie in Phoenix Zoo in Arizona. Right. And the wonderful thing about Rosie was, and they sort of discovered it by accident, 
they would set up a, an easel with a canvas on. Yes. They would put out a palette of coloured paint for her. I remember saying this. She, yes. she would use her trunk to say yes. I want that colour. Mm -hmm. Then they would hold out a whole load of different brushes. She would select a brush with her trunk. They would load the brush with paint. Mm -hmm. She would then pick up the brush with her trunk and go <laughs> onto the canvas. <laughs> Amazing. And it, and it actually became sort of these impressionist works. And they were there was a queue a mile long to get these paintings, and they, I think they were being sold in America for about ten thousand dollars. Oh my goodness, that's a, that's loads of money. It's loads of money. So anyway, we got this. I brought it back. I even stopped at customs saying, "I don't know if I should declare this, but I've been in America, and this is a painting I got over there, and it's by an elephant." And and they, all they did was laugh. Just they to just think laughed. it was just a wind up. Well, no, I said, I'm working no. for BBC, that's life. And they sort right. of said, oh, we get this. I don't right. think any value. Through you go, you know, so. Mm -hmm. and, and then we, we took it to three different art experts. And we, we set it up and said, this is an American artist. Give us your opinion. So the first two were going, well, I can see there's a lot of heat in here. It's very dynamic. Whatever they've been, they've been influenced by this. And, you know, they gave all these, uh, what they saw. Yes. Them. Yeah, yeah. And then I took it to the late Brian Sewell, who was um, the art critic for the Evening Standard. Yes. Brian was ever so, ever so. He was very, very polite, you know, very well educated, very cultured. Yeah. So we took the painting into him and I said, Brian, this is the latest hot American artist. And he went, oh, it's rubbish. It's terrible. <laughs> oh, no technique. And he just tore it apart. And I said, oh but this particular American artist is so hot just now, and there's a waiting. They went, Well, that tells you everything about Americans. <laughs> and, and, was, and he just cut, no, he, he did not care. He did not. No. Care. So it was great. He was the only one to suss out. And then I told them, I said, Actually, it was painted by an elephant. And they went, That doesn't surprise me. <laughs> <laughs> and and like said, he, he had the good grace to say, Well, I suppose if it was an elephant. They're actually quite talented then, you know. So. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and surfing dogs I did over there as well. Um, before all the TikTok generation. Came of along, course. Have you still got the picture? Um, I, I, somewhere, somewhere around. Somewhere around, yes. It's ready for the anti, it's ready for Dickinson's real deal. It is. <laughs> <laughs> you have I to wait until that. that comes into town. I wonder what it would fetch. I know, yeah. that would be interesting. You'll be in front of the camera there, you see. <laughs> Because you've been behind it for too long. I have for a while, I have for a while. Yeah, has music taken over now for you? Um, or would you consider going back to be a face on television? Or do you prefer being behind the camera, like doing your voiceovers for Loose Women and various other television shows as well? I don't, I don't mind either. You know, because I think it's all part and parcel of the same process. Because what people don't get credit for is all the work that goes on behind the cameras. Yes. Because we're, we're the lucky people, we're the face, we're the voice at the front. But what the, you know, That's Life had about 50 people in the office during the week, researchers, assistant producers, producers, directors, and all of this team were working together to ensure that the show got on the air. Yes. So they all had a vital role to play in it because they, they helped research the stories. Although we, we researched our own stories as well, but they were out there running through all the 10,000 letters we used to get every week. Yes. We're all, they, they came in in massive buckets, Phil. I mean, they were wheeled in in these big yeah, but buckets. Like, I mean, it's like, I, I suppose it would like, it's like when I used to watch Saturday Superstar, they would yeah. bring all of the sacks of mail in and everyone Absolutely. had sent in a stamped addressed envelope. And that is on every single BBC show. It was... Put it on a stamped address envelope too. Ba 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 ba. It might be in why don't you or Saturday Superstar going live or whatever. Yes. But yes. it was just amazing when you saw all of them letters in them bags. And that was the real deal. It wasn't a prop man making that up. That was, you know, real, absolutely amazing. It was. And we used to plunge in because every single letter was read. Yes. So every, we, we used to just sit round and we would pile in, bring up pile and read through. And you're sifting for what are really good stories. Yes. Because we, we were given loads of stories. Some of them, you know, um, they obviously meant a lot to the people that wrote in, but sometimes they wouldn't have made a good TV story. No. So, but we used to get loads of, loads of 
nasty neighbour letters. That, that was one of the biggest categories. Oh my goodness. My neighbour's hedge, my neighbour's tree, my <laughs> neighbour's drive, my neighbour's car, my neighbour's dog. That was a, that was one of the biggest complaints. And occasionally we would find one that could make good television. And I remember um, before I joined, because I watched this as well, there was a, a gentleman who had a piece of property and his garden went down in between two others and he blocked off the road that ran along the back. So the two neighbours on either side, who had been really friends, they couldn't get transport, they couldn't do anything. So <laughs> Esther got two cherry pickers, two big cranes, for the neighbours yes. to go up. And they could have a conversation up in the air, above, you know, shouting across. Yes. So it, it was just great, great television. So we had a lot of those, we had a lot of corn men, always the corn men and uh, corn women as well, and, and the, the myths. Um, and I ended up doing undercover stuff and uh, going out and exposing. One of the first things I did was, uh, and it was actually quite clever. And this is this was the thing about con men. See if they actually applied their, their talents and skills to something legal. Yes. They probably would have done really well. But there was something in them that they, they always felt that they had to um, con people. Or yes. they, were, they, they were stealing. They were stealing. So the, the, the first thing I did was... Um, a company were buying these really cheap watches, and I mean really cheap. They were worth about a five. Right. But they actually looked good. But inside, when you took them apart, they had a terrible, you know, plastic parts, and it yes. wasn't the an engineer. Yes. Well. And they made up designer names. So the first thing they, they did was uh, Jean-Philippe. So they were sort of playing on Philippe Patek. Yes, yes. And the next thing, the one when I came along, it was Enzo Giomani, which sounds oh. a bit like Giorgio Armani. Yes. So Enzo Giomani. And then they took out full page adverts in, in Vogue and get this, the back cover of Playboy. Okay. <laughs> and oh, they, took, they took these wonderful pictures of these uh, men's and women's watches, four different models they had, and they put the prices beside them. And it was like £450, uh, which was a lot of money. Yes, of course, watch. yes. Watch. So the con was, the salesmen all around the country, they would pay £25 for each watch. Yeah. Then they would go out, and I would see you, Phil, in yeah. the shop, car park or something, and go, hey, hey mate, come here, come here. Yeah. I know you're busy, but do you fancy doing me a favour? I deliver these watches, and they've given me two pieces too many. Right. And I'm just looking for beer money. Look, and they would show them the advert, they're worth 450 quid. Right. What? Oh. So they were actually appealing to people's um, naughty nature as well. Who yes. Thinking, oh, I'm getting something off the back of a lorry here. Yes. So, and if, if people fell into that trap, then that was their own nature, if you like. Yes. So they, they would sell hundreds of these things every day, thousands, all up and down the country. So I applied for the job, got a job. We rigged up a car with secret cameras in it with these massive recorders in the boot of the car. I bet, yes. I was yeah. in those days. Yeah. And if they'd opened the boot, they would have gone, this is like a mobile recording <laughs> studio, mate. What are you doing? <laughs> and I managed, to, over a couple of days, I managed to get the story and get it in the can. And we got the, one of the salesmen, bang to rights in and, and there. Um, and it was, as I say, it was such a clever thing that they thought through. Yes. But if you actually invested in a, a proper brand, they probably could have done it the right way. If you yes. Like. Yes, yes. So, so there, there's always, people are always out to con you. And back, yeah. back then, it was the fax con, you know, I am, I've got $25 million in the bank. I just need to borrow your bank account. To, to, <laughs> that's right. And that's now become an email thing. It is, yes, or text. You get a text. Yeah, yeah it's, it, you know, te high tech has now made it easier for the con men. It and has. They, can, they can get far bigger numbers. Yes. Because they've got far bigger numbers, they actually gather more people into the net. So, Shows like That's Life were always there to protect the viewers and inform them. At, at its peak, 24, 25 million viewers a week, which meant that one in three of the population in the UK were tuning in. Yes, and I think, I think um, did Watchdog not start after, like, because of That's Life doing this kind of thing? Do yes. you think uh, Watchdog is something with, uh, and it was with Lynn Folds Wood, wasn't Lynn, it? Yeah, Lynn, and, uh, uh, Lynn was just down the corridor from us because Watchdog oh. were at one of the same department features. All oh, right, yes, uh, yes. And they were sort of rivals, but friendly rivals. Right. They were they were a bit more straight laced. We had a formula where we could um, Esther would sugarcoat the pill. 
Right. Because we would do sometimes these really in-depth investigative things, things like the child abuse from yes. which child came. Child came, yes. Came. We would go for those really serious, emotionally hard stories, if you yes. like. Whereas Watchdog was more about um, fridges, white goods, things, you know, c consumer goods, more not human side, although they did some great stories. Yes. But we did it in a very different way. But we were friendly rivals and, uh, you know, I, I've known uh, Lynn, for, I haven't seen her in quite a few years, but we, we'd say hello to each other in the canteen and, oh, what are you working on this week? Oh, we've got a story about this, a story about that. And a lot of the, the behind the scenes team would cross. Cross out, right. Because when we were on the air, they weren't on the air. So when yes. we came off the air, Watchdog would come on. So there was no real overlap. Uh, but it was a great show, and it's still it's still a great show. You know, when it, when it goes out as a, a little strand in the one show and things, it's, it's always been a great show. I like the thirty minute version though. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's I did. Longer. Yeah. Yes, I thought Lynn Lynn Foldswood. I forget the, um, her husband's name. What's he called again? John. 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 I was going to say John, and I should know this, and I can't remember <laughs> right now. I need to go to. I'll Uncle put you on the spot. Uncle Google. Yes. So. But, uh, but there you go. But there anyway. you go then. Right. But um, go, coming off the um, that life thing, there was a story which was done, which I can't really remember at all. But it featured. Um, was it Marty Webb and Ben? Was that something? To, wasn't it? Was that an appeal or something? What, Can you uh, remember you talking, that? You're talking about Ben Hardwick. Is that what it must have been? Yes. On uh, um, yes, because they had. I think they showed film uh, mm. on the program, and I vividly, well, I actually vividly remember uh, Marty Webb and Ben uh, as being the uh, a, a, a song that was going on. Mm. It, was it to do with an appeal or something? It sounded. It, it, I can't remember the Marty part, but I do remember Ben Hardwick and having watched the show at that time, again, it was before my time. Ben was just a young boy. He was about two, three years old, and he needed a kidney. Yeah. He needed a kidney. And uh, the appeal went out. His parents got in touch with us because we were sort of the last resort because the doctors had said, look, he's not going to live. Right. And at such a young age, and to try and get a donor. Because back in those days, what people forget, Phil, is that, that do donating your organs wasn't the norm. No. It's actually quite unusual. Yes. So that meant that the selection pool he had was, was even less. Yes. So we put the story on the show and he was a lovely wee boy. When you look back and you see the uh, see the film of him just playing, he's just a lovely wee boy mm. who was looking forward to, to trying to grow up and yes. uh, get older. But unfortunately, because of his condition, he couldn't. No. So we put it out on the show. And there was a massive response, an absolutely massive response. And he did actually get a, a, a kidney. Right. Unfortunately, over the, the, the next few months, it never took. Because again, this was really early days of uh, transplants and, and yes. things like that. But what it did do was it brought people's attention to the fact that this is possible. Yes. And when he died, the whole country was crying. Yes, of course. So, yes. So, in fact, I'm well enough just now. You yes. think, talk about it. I think they may have actually played the that song, Ben. Song. It was. Where, yes, when, yes, unfortunately, under the circumstances. Well, sorry to bring that up and upset you, but no, it, no, 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 I, it touches me no. as well, actually, just talking about yeah. it as well. Because it was just when you saw the pictures and things, and I was only probably quite young at the time, but it was something that touched my heart. And that, yeah. and is, is that something that brought out the donor card, do you think? Oh, absolutely. That, that, this is what... Because uh, I remember is, them coming out, yeah. the donor card, and you would tick the card, and you and it was just um, a piece of, like, cardboard, and you would oh. carry it in your wallet. Um, but now you do it online, I believe. But, um, yeah. yeah, it was amazing. I, I still got. I was looking for my wallet there. I don't have it to hand uh, because I'm sure I've still got my old donor card in there, and I have registered online. Yes. So they can have they can have my eyes if they want. I don't think they'd be very good because, as you can see, I wear glasses. Uh, <laughs> but if, if something happened, I'd be very happy to yes. think that maybe somebody had been helped. And you're right. There was a massive increase then in people signing up for it, which meant that other people after then had a chance or a bigger chance. Yes. Because, as you know, it's all about matching the blood type and uh, sometimes it's the DNA, etc, etc, etc. There's so many little parameters you need to 
to satisfy before the body will accept it. But so a lot of campaigns like that came out um, of that's life, and as you've just said, they touched people's hearts. Yes, and that was the big difference between us and Watchdog. They were a bit more straight down the line about uh, manufactured goods, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yes, and yours was like people stories. Exactly. Exactly. Yes. Um, and as I say, and there was also the humorous side. We've, we've talked of a lot course, about yes. the serious side. But, uh, you know, when I joined, it was Doc Cox and Scott Sharon who were doing the funnies. Yes. We also had people at like June Whitfield, Molly Southern came in for a while. And um, the absolutely amazing Kate Robbins, who's from your neck of the woods. Yes, she's fantastic. Yes. Uh, yes, I know of the um, our brother, Ted. Ted, yeah, who's. Yes. Oh, and he was doing lots and lots of warm-ups, so I bet you, yes. did he give you any tips for your warm-ups? Because people may um, not know that you do warm-ups for uh, yeah. television shows, um, and it could, I think it's across all channels you do it, really. I do, I do. Um, in fact, for about 10 years, Solid, there was not a show, there was not a Saturday night that didn't have a show that I was involved in. Fabulous. So if it was a lottery shows like Who Dares Wins or In It To Win It or um, Five Star Holiday Challenge, uh, or on ITV, I did The Voice and The Voice Kids. Right. Um, although that, that wasn't my gig, that was actually a wonderful chap called Stuart Holdham. Right. Uh, and he's, he's brilliant, he's absolutely brilliant. Ted was brilliant as well. Because yes. there's probably about, a, you know, for a while there was maybe about a dozen people that yes. did all the shows and we all knew, we knew of each other. Uh, and Stewie was actually doing Strictly Come Dancing at the same oh, time. So whenever he couldn't do it, I would pick up the voice of the voice kids and things. And what a lot of people don't know is these shows are really done, mostly done in batches. Yes. So um, so you pre-record a lot of them, a lot of the quiz shows and things. Uh, and they go out over the Saturdays or the Sundays or whenever. The, the yes, day. yes. But it's great fun. And Ted I knew of, Ted was more of a stand-up comic. I was more of a cheerleader. Yes. I would just come in singing and dancing, get them on the fleet, get them clapping. To get get them loosening their inhibitions. Yes, yes. Whereas Ted got them laughing to do that. Yes. I'm, I wasn't as good as a comedian. Ted would come in and go, "My, when we were growing up, I was we were so posh. We had fruit, and nobody in the house was ill. You know, and, <laughs> that's uh, great. He would just he would do all this, and, and he was brilliant. And Kate, when she was on our show doing the funnies, he is so talented with her voices. She was on <laughs> spit an image. Yeah, and she was just brilliant because you could give her a piece of paper about a joke and she would sit there and she'd run through and go, what voice am I going to do this in? And she would try it out in different accents. And right. Different... And she's just amazing. I've always, I still follow her on Twitter and she was just brilliant. And another person who we had in who was an absolute delight mm -hmm. was June Whitfield. Auntie Excellent. Auntie June. She was just a treasure. And everyone loved her. She was so unassuming, and she wasn't that tall. You know, no, she was, tiny. she was beautifully packaged. And a yes, yes. And she would come in and she would sit down and go, "Hello, everyone. Hi, hi. I'm June." And she would sit and do her thing and go. And funnily enough, when the show, the show ended in 1994, yes, and it must have been about more oh, 15 years, the late 2000s, the noughties, if you like. Yes. And Adrian Mills and I, and Adrian was on the show. We we are great pals. And we've yes. had a trip now for 30 odd years. And we were walking through Wimbledon Village, uh, where he lives. And who comes out the thick but June? And we went, hello, June. And she went, well, hello, boys. How are you doing? I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> and we were just leathered. Amazing. And it was like, it was just like it was yesterday. And yes. she was so good. And we said, what were you up to just now? And she went, well, she said, I think I'm about to become quite cool with the kids again, because I've just been asked to go on Doctor Who. So all the kids are going to be talking about, you know, and she was just wonderful. She was absolutely wonderful. Um, and funnily enough, I've become friends with her niece. Right. I, and, and purely, I was introduced through friends. We became friends with her and her husband. Yes. And as we were talking, uh, and she said something, oh, my, my my auntie used to work for the BBC a lot. And I said, who's your auntie? She went, June Whitfield. And I went, what? Amazing. <laughs> wow. It's so amazing. It is. It's a very small world. So, and, and all the funnies, as I say, Doc Cox was just brilliant. He was so clever and would come up with all these funny songs and rhymes, but all coming from the viewers. Yes. I remember we did a, he, he gathered all these funny place names, 
like I... um, lower bottom. In oh, yes, 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 yes so, I remember them. So he had a whole list of these things and composed a song around it. Yes. And we all sing and dance in the background. It was just brilliant. And one of the other, my favourite memories was um, Doc had composed a song as well. And myself, Gavin, Adrian and Doc yes. dressed with the Beatles. Eesh. So we all had the mop top wigs on. They right. made us these grey suits like the boys. You with know. the bites. Yes, yes. All that things, yeah, yeah. That, that was it. So we Trademark. All had, we all had that. And uh, Michael Paretsky, who was a wonderful director on the show, he hired a big open top bus. Right. And we drove round London in this open top bus, playing along, playing instruments along to, to the song. So it was, it was a music video. Excellent. And the other thing was we recreated we recreated the Abbey Road walk, but we did, you know, across the zebra crossing. Yes, yes. So we did it outside the Houses of Parliament. Oh, amazing. We couldn't get away up to Abbey Road to come back down and do it. Yes. So we're all walking across, you know, doing the doing the John Paul George and uh, Ringo thing. Yes, yes. And uh, and the traffic were going, was eh, get out of the way, you know. So, <laughs> so, uh, so we disrupted the traffic outside the Houses of Parliament for a, for a minute or so. Uh, but, the, but all of these things, they were all the great memories I have of the show and all the different fun things that we had to do as well. Yes. Um, I mean, Doc Cox, um, my wife, um, she met him and she was going, when I when I mentioned that I was going to be interviewing you, she says, oh, um, how was Doc Cox? Uh -huh. Ah, right. Well, I, um, I, I, I'm not too sure. I think he's all right. I think right. he had a little bit of ill health. But Doc treats everything with great humour. Yes. And he has a couple of bands on the go. He always has a, two different bands. Right. Because as well as all the funny stuff, he's a brilliantly talented guitar player and banjo player. My and he's really into blues, so he has a blues band. Right. And really good, you know, he's got some really good musicians. And he just goes round and plays little pubs and things. And people are sitting there going, I know that guy. Where did I know that guy from? Yeah. And then it's the Penny Falls, and they go, that's Doc Cox. So, so he's still going strong. Uh, his partner, she's a great saxophonist uh, who sometimes plays along with things. Uh, but I haven't spoken to Doc now in quite a while. We right. usually have reunions every so often. Right. And, you know, we haven't seen each other for four or five years, and then we'll get together and we, we catch up. So, uh, so I'll just need to wait till the next time. Indeed, yes. And we'll, we'll watch with bated breath. As you may say, as you could say, um, gathering some of the finest musicians like Chuck Sabo, who's worked with Elton John, take that, Robbie Williams, Natalie Imbruglia, and mm. on and on drums, uh, Chuck Sabo is, and Chris Mars of the Flock of Seagulls on keyboards. They've helped bring a very distinctive feel and sound to London Town, your current album, which mm. was recorded at Battery Studios and mastered at the famous Abbey Road Studios. What was it like recording in the studio at Battery? It's it's great fun because Battery, uh, for, for those of you who've never heard of it, um, Back in the 90s, it was sort of the place to go to in North London and Wilson. Oh. Everyone was recording it. Uh, Frankie Goes to Hollywood, Relax, was recorded in that studio. Uh, you Spin Me Round uh, was uh, was recorded there. It was remixed. Actually, I relax. sorry, yes. I beg your pardon. Spin Me, Spin Me Round was PWL, but Relax was definitely done there. Yes. Uh, and there were loads of great things. Uh, other different artists, um, Eric Clapton, was recorded there right. and you can go right back to the 60s all the way through there were a lot of dance acts that came through at that time as well that, that recorded there and ZTT which is a very famous label yes it is artists, yes all yes. of their artists were, were based there yes so to be in that building you you hope that something through osmosis the energy sort of rubs off yes all down the corridors they, they have a sort of a communal area with a wood burner down near the kitchen where People would come from all the different studios and hang out. Oh, what are you doing in the next door? Oh, you're in there. Oh, yes. I'm so -so. And a bit of cross pollination. Yes. And they've got all this great memorabilia everywhere gold discs, platinum discs. Amazing. Amazing. Blacks, uh, Eurythmics. Oh, this is to commemorate half a million sales. Or oh, my goodness. They've got all these old equipment, tape recorders. And they even had the funniest thing, which I thought was they had a contract still hanging on the wall right iron maiden 
Excellent. Book, booking the studio in 1992, and the old thing was they booked the whole complex. They booked right. two weeks solid, 24 hours access, because I think that was real. They did rock and roll hours. Yes. So they go, right, it's 11 o'clock at night. We've had a couple of beers. Let's go in and record something. So they would record through the night and then sleep during the day and then come in at night. Right. Uh, and I think, I think they'd hired it for, I think it was about eight grand a week or something at the time. Oh my goodness. Uh, so, but they had the whole thing. Yes. So all of these little things you're saying and you're going, I'm recording where they recorded. I'm recording where you're with me. Yes, yes. Uh, they did the Braveheart theme here. They did this, they did that. <laughs> so that is very inspirational. Yes. Uh, and Rowan, my producer at the time, he took me in and we just bit by bit because I had to, I funded all this myself, so I have to save up. Right. Go in, do a song, go away for a while, save up some more money, go back in. So it did take a, a, a little while to come together. Yes. And then at the end, uh, uh, Rowan knew a wonderful mastering engineer called Miles Shaw. And Miles works at Abbey Road, out of Abbey right. Road. And he has mixed everyone. He's just finished remastering the Beatles. The digital, uh, yes. Re-edition. He he. What really got me because there were loads of people, but I honed in on this. I went, oh, "You did Insomnia by Faithless." <gasps> it's a good tune. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. That was I, I was one of the first to hear it. That was, and I, I just was, oh my god. I we're, not, <laughs> and, we're not worthy. <laughs> we're not worthy. Excellent. But the nicest thing that happened on the day was uh, when we went in. You're obviously walking up those stairs. Yeah. Or, it's Abbey Road, baby. <laughs> it's Abbey Road. Uh, I walked in and Miles, as a mastering engineer, he's never heard the songs before. But he's listening to hear about frequencies. Yes. He doesn't necessarily uh, have an interest in the song per se. No. He said, give me three songs that I can listen to that give me a sort of a spread of what the album sounds like. Yes. So I had three songs, a brand new friend, Searching, um, and I think Ghosts. I picked them out and he said, right, that gives me a cross section. And he turned around and he went, Kevin, it's now, and I'm going to bleep myself here. Mm-hmm. It's nice to hear some proper bleep songs. He said, because these are proper songs. <laughs> he said, it's great. He says, for a while I've been doing a lot of K pop, th- which is very synthesized and very clean. It is. He said, yours are proper songs. They're not cut and paste. No. It, every chorus is slightly different, everything sounds slightly different. He said, they're proper songs. And at that point, my heart just went, oh, and this is a man who's worked with all these fantastic artists giving me a compliment. And it was like, oh, wow. thank you so much. So, yes. uh, so it's, it's, it's been a wonderful experience. And I love the whole process. Phil, yeah. I love, I've got my keyboard down here just now, I switched it off. Uh, for the interview, but right. I've got a keyboard here, I've got my speakers there, I've got my big screen to, to sort of work on. I love teasing out these melodies, teasing out these tunes, yes. teasing out these lyrics, and trying to go to a place to say, I know you're out there, because that's all songwriters are. The songs are just out there. It's yes. up to, to, to they're, they're like will of the wisps. Yes. So gentle to yes. pull them through and say, yeah. thank you for coming, thank you. Oh, there's yeah. another bit there, and it's just so gentle. And then you try and weave it together into some sort of semblance of a story or yes. a melody that people can connect with. It sounds absolutely fantastic. I, your current single, Searching for the Answers, mm. um, is absolutely fantastic. But I'm all, but I've, I'm drawn to London Town, which is yeah. a great track. What was it like writing and recording that song about the iconic city as it really captures London in four minutes and 30 seconds? Yeah, it, it was sort of a semi-autobiographical and that London has always been lucky for me, always. I won the job there. I, yes. I moved down to London, had a great time, then I moved back to Scotland. Yes. And then what I didn't know was when I was auditioning for That's Life back in 1991. Yes. I had set in motion a chain of events that would lead me to a lot later. Um, Adrian Mills left the show. I replaced him. Then Adrian came back and we were already friends, but we became even greater friends. Yes. Then when the show finished, we you know, we, we didn't drift apart, but, but we just lost, not lost contact. We weren't together all the time. I moved back up to Scotland, but I always kept in touch yeah. and I would occasionally come down and see him. And then in 2009, I came down to see him in the July 
and I stayed with him and his wife, his wonderful wife, Nikki. Uh, she was opening up a new restaurant. I went along, helped, blah, blah, blah. And I'd had this pull to cut. I thought, I'm I'm feeling the call of London again. Yes. I thought, I, I've done everything I can up in Scotland. I'm feeling the call. I'm feeling the call. So I then just booked a flight in the October to come back down. I never even asked him. I phoned him up and said, by the way, I'm coming. Right. And it was great. He went, okay, right, we'll get the spare room ready. Uh, that's fine. That's fine. We'll meet up. And during that time, I flew down on the Thursday night. And on the Friday morning, I was sitting at breakfast, and one of Nikki, his wife's friends, yes. came walking into the kitchen. This uh, beautifully gorgeous German girl called Birgit. Yes. And she swept into the kitchen. I thought, she's really nice. Uh, and I just sat there. And, she, and, and funnily enough, she looked at me and went, oh, he's not a morning person. Because she said, I was sitting there looking very pasty faced, eating a bit of toast. <laughs> She's absolutely right. I'm not a morning person, I'm a nighttime person. She's the opposite. Right. And I'm giving you a clue now as to what's happened. So that night, we all went out for dinner in a group, a big group of friends, and I, I just happened to sit beside her and we just started chatting and blabbing. And long story short, over the weekend, we met up a few times. Right. And Adrian's wife, Nikki, sort of spotted something. So she did a little bit of mixing. And I phoned Beer getting asked her out while I was down there. We went out on our first date, which was wonderful. Yes. Then, uh, again, I'm trying to condense this. We had a long distance relationship for about nine months, ten months. Right. And I moved down to London. And we're now married. We've been together for 14 years. We've been married for five. It was and, but so absolutely so, magical. So, so getting the, the job on that's life, yes. I didn't know that over t- nearly two decades later, I would meet my, my wife because of it. <laughs> and that for me is just mind blowing. So London has always been lucky. Yes. So London town is trying to capture the essence of it, but it's about people arriving with one dream in mind, because I thought I was coming back down for work. Yes. That, that was the pool, that's that's what I thought. But yep. it was actually for something completely different. It was to <sighs> my wife. And I think a lot of people who come to London, we all, it's a wonderful city. Yes. Theatres, bars, restaurants, sites, you know, all of the great statues, the great squares, the, the hubbub, the buzz, the West End, the theatres. It's, it's, fam- it's fabulous. Marvellous. So we're all drawn by that. But when we're there, our hearts kick into place and something magical can happen that you meet someone you yes. never expected to meet. No. The next thing you know. So that's what London Town's about, how we, we come down with, with something in mind but it changes into something else. Yes. I mean, I love London. I mean, I've, I did my work experience at BBC Television Centre uh, oh. in the news department, yeah. and um, Moira Stewart was doing the news, and I oh. was so privileged to do the vamps and tags on the headlines today, you know, and all that <laughs> carry on. But I absolutely am hoping and praying that, because I, I auditioned for a television programme last year and I mm-hmm. can't discuss it on this interview, unfortunately, because I haven't okay. been selected yet, uh, but I had to reply again. But I just cannot wait to walk through those doors of Television Centre again, because I haven't been there since 1995. Mm-hmm. And it would be just, I bet it's exactly the same. It'll still be two-toned walls and it'll still have round, have all of the old fashioned doors, where, which was the dressing rooms in oh. the donut there. So uh, <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. But yeah, it's magical, isn't it? London and everything about it. And it's just, it's so showbiz. I love that bit. It is, but, but there's other, you know, Glasgow is a great city as well. Edinburgh, yes. Manchester, Newcastle, Liverpool, Birmingham, they're all great, great cities. Cardiff, yes. another great city. Yes. So they all have their own uh, sort of little flavour. Qualities. As Qualities it and flavours. Yes. So yes. you know that people are slightly different, but these, as I say, all of them have got great, great architecture to frame the, the, the sort of the energy that buzzes around these cities. Yes, uh, but, but I do, but I do love London, and you can tell me off air. By the way, once we was finished, you can tell me off air. Uh, well, indeed, yes. I promise uh, not to tell ho- anyone. Hopefully, the production team aren't watching this. <laughs> 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 They'll be going. He's not going in that show. The producer will be going. He's not going in that show. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wish you all the very best. But uh, thank you I so have, much, Kevin. I have been back to Television Centre since it's been done up. If you like. Right. And it is, um, there's still a great vibe there. 
even though it's not all about the television anymore, because as you know, the, the round, the big donut has all been converted into flats. That's right. But there's yes. still, the, the, some of the, the, the studios are still there. They're still operating, still working. The reception area is sort of the same. They've tried to keep a bit all of, of the light. wood. But there's, there's loads of what used to be studios are now big bars and restaurants. Oh, um, right. And we were up at one of the meeting rooms and we were, we were all sitting there going, I'm sure this used to be the back of such and such, you know, PC2 <laughs> right. or something. So right. and we all worked it out because they kept this little bit, the flooring and everything was the same. Yes. And the panels were the same. And we, we were all looking around, but yeah, we definitely, we've been in here for such and such a recording or, or done that. Yes. And what was great about Television Centre was um, you mentioned the dressing rooms yes. because they used to be all round. The they did, up. yes. But it had the names on the doors there as well. Names Who the were the regulars? Were if your name yeah. was on the door, you were very important. I was just going to say that because <laughs> when we recorded, uh, it originally used to be recorded on the Sunday, and then they switched to the to the the Friday um, yes. when we were recording. Yes, and there were there were six star dressing rooms as they called it. Yeah, and. And at the beginning, just off the reception there. So now we were given these on the Friday for our recording. But dressing room number one mm -hmm. is always off limits. Now, who do you think that would have been for? And it wasn't for anyone in our show. Was it for Terry Wogan? Correct. Ah, Correct. there you go. Correct. <laughs> Ten bonus points to that man. Well done. Amazing. And it was it was Terry's uh, dressing room because he was doing three shows a week at that time, so they kept a thing. Yes, he was he doing his was, walking, wasn't he? He was. He was. Yes, and he, yes. this was the only dressing room that had a keypad entry system. <laughs> so really, high time. we were all given you know keys with a label on them. You had yeah. to go in and do your thing, which was, was still wonderful. And the same for them. And I remember walking along one day and suddenly dressing room one's door burst open and Terry stuck his head out and went uh -huh. left and right. And I went, hello, Terry, how you doing? Hello, hello. And then he just went back in and shut the door. <laughs> and I went, that was really bizarre. <laughs> yes. That was really bizarre. But what I did notice when the door was open, right? he had his own wee bar, a mini bar, right, a wee fridge and things. Wow which had a couple of bottles of something or whatever in it. Yes. And he also had a little leprechaun statue. But he <laughs> was a leprechaun. It was made in his image. And Amazing. I, I think somebody's made that for him as a gift. Yes. And it, by the way, it was brilliant. It was absolutely brilliant. It was like Wogan squashed down a bit and a little green eye <laughs> you know, as, as leprechaun. That's excellent, that. that. I wonder where that is. <laughs> Um, and of course, the, the, as you know, the great thing about TV Centre was you'd go down to the canteen and you would see other presenters, you'd see news reporters, you'd see That's actors, right. that were You'd see out. Ian McCaskill there, you know, he's just yeah. over there. Or you'd see, when I was down there one time um, in the canteen, it was um, somebody who actually put together, or he was one of the producers or something, of the uh, Eurovision Song Contest. I was like, pardon? Wow. It was like, one of those moments and you're thinking pardon i mean i went to the bbc bar as well which obviously will be yes. might be old hat now oh no it's still there oh it's still it's there still is it still up on, the, up on the top there i think it's actually owned now by soho house oh right okay. they've got they've got a club there now so it's yes. but the bar's still because i remember you could go onto the rooftop terrace yes as yes well. yes you see, I remember all those years ago. I was probably only 16 at the time or something like that. Mm. But I remember those days absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Absolutely amazing. Well, going back to that life, actually, are there any special celebrations coming up or TV specials you could tell us about as this was and still is classed as an iconic show celebrating 50 years? The, the, what happened was, we've actually, I'm sure you can get it on a, a BBC iPlayer, it was on the one show, they did a tribute, um, uh, it would be May the 20, whatever the Tuesday was. Oh, was it? oh right. The 22nd or something. Because was the anniversary on the f last Friday? It was, it yes. was. But the, but the one show had done it previous on the Tuesday. Yes. And they did a lovely little sort of 10 minute feature. Oh, uh, right. Unfortunately, Esther couldn't be on the show because she's not keeping too well just now. Oh, right. She, they read out a lovely letter from her, which had loads of humour in it. And, yes. and I thought, that's Esther. She's, that's yes. her words. That's how she writes. That's how she would sit. And she, she just puts little bits of humour in. 
uh, and, and apologise for not being able to be there because obviously they would love to have had her on the show. Um, but it was great seeing some of the old faces and some of the different um, campaigns that we've been talking about going out yes. Ben, yes. Uh, playground safety, uh, and a lot of the funny stuff as well, and all the different presenters, some of whom unfortunately aren't with us anymore. Yes. Van Benham's gone, um, Kieran, uh, oh no, Kieran's still there, Glenn Worsnup unfortunately passed away. Mm -hmm. So we are we are a, a family, we are an ageing family now. Yes, yes. We're still very much a family. because Ageing very well. Yeah, thank you. Uh, we call ourselves lifers. Lifers, I like yeah, that. Lifers. So anyway, that's, that's lifer. Yeah, we are. That's we are life. <laughs> so, uh, so, so apart from that, I think there's, there, there have been a, uh, some lovely articles in the press. The Guardian did one this week, which uh, went over the, the the history of the show. So, right. if you look round, if you Google it on online, I'm sure you will be able to find all of these different pieces that have that have gone out there. Uh, right. And even a few radio pieces as well. So, excellent. And I'll have a hunt for them, and I'll attach them to this interview on YouTube if there's something on there. And finally, Kevin, it's nearly come to the end of the interview. And finally, would you like to introduce your latest single? Certainly, um, ladies and gentlemen. This is a brand new single from me, Kevin Devine, which I hope you thoroughly enjoy. It's called Searching for the Answers. It's going to be coming out in uh, June, June the 23rd, I think is the, the day it drops. Uh, and the album's online already on Spotify, on Amazon, on Apple Music. You can follow me on my socials. On Twitter, it's at Divine Inc, Divine E-N-C. Uh, on Facebook, it's at the Kevin Divine. You can get my music page there. I'll be delighted to pick up some new followers, and that will keep you all uh, informed of any time I'm going to go out and do some dates and things. But mostly, folks, I, I do hope you enjoy the single. Thank you very much, Kevin, and thank you for joining me. And good luck with the album London Town. And hopefully, we can have you on the show once again in the future, and you can tell us what you're up to. Pleasure, Phil. Thank you so much for having me on. No problem at all. Take care now. Thanks, Kevin. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. It's the best way to start your day. Bill Wilson in the morning on Radio Shields.